please welcome Dr. Rand Paul. Thank you. It's uh, good to be here in Paducah. I came a couple times when my dad was running and got to meet some of you before. The uh, people say, well, are you running? And that's a tough question. Are you running or are you not running? That's a million dollar question. And uh, we've actually got a call today, and we're going to do it on national TV next Thursday or Friday and make our announcement. Um, it's still a complicated question. Are you running or are you not running? Senator Bunning has said he's running. Every time he's asked, he's running. But the follow-up question from every reporter has been, okay, Jim, are, are you really running? And uh, the process and the gossip and everything has been fueled last week when another candidate, another Republican, says, well, I'm going to form an exploratory committee, and Senator Bunning said, well, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead and form an exploratory committee, and, but I'm still running, but I won't run if I don't raise the money. But now he's encouraging someone else from the same part of the state to raise money against him, so some question whether or not this is all in the up and up or whether or not it's just to lay the foundation for this other person to develop a campaign for three or four months, people stay on the sidelines, and then it doesn't happen. So I've been kind of gauging my support around the state and going around to different places. We sent out a press release earlier this week and we got one of the syndicated columnists from around the state to pick it up and our press release started, some politicians go to Washington to ask for permission to run for office. They go on bended knee to ask for some kind of special anointing process and that just makes my skin kind of crawl that somehow people in Washington, even if they're elected, are more important than you guys. Yeah. And I think Kentuckians can make decisions for themselves. I don't think that you as Kentuckians need to be told what to do. And in fact, Republicans are kind of independent spirited people. I don't think they like to be told what to do by their government or by politicians. And so we sent out a release and said, we're not asking, but we don't think, you know, it is a commonwealth, but we don't think there should be a coronation. So we're going to go out and ask Kentuckians what they think. So yesterday I went to Teresa's Diner, which is a local place there. I'm coming to Paducah today and I'll be having breakfast in Lexington, which reminds me, this probably isn't something you can do with your federal office, but the one thing we need to do is be in one time zone. It's crazy to be in two time zones. I really figure I could get some unification on uh, having one time zone. But as I've gone around the state, one of the things I try to impress people with is where does philosophy or my philosophy of government begin with? Thomas Paine wrote that government is a necessary evil. And I think that's a very simple and short statement, but an important statement. We kind of understand that some government is necessary, but what does it mean to be a necessary evil? I think it means that for every ounce of government you get, you give up a corresponding ounce of your freedom. So it means that it's a double-edged sword. There are things we have to have government do, but we should always minimize it. We should always ask, can the private marketplace do this, or do we have to have government do this? So that question starts all the time. From the next, from that bit of philosophy, I think you then ask, is government too big or too small? And I think most of us here think government's too big, probably at the state level, but all incredibly too large at the federal level. So we say, if it's too big, then how could we ever be for tax increases? So with my taxpayer group, we've had uh, representatives sign the taxpayer pledge. We had at one time 55 in the House had signed the pledge. No, not in the House. We had about 30 in the House, and we had a uh, 10 or 15 in the state senate that signed this pledge. The media criticizes me and says, oh, well, he's just an anti, this is what the Courier Journal says, that. he's just an anti-tax absolutist. As if we're simple-minded because we're absolutely opposed to tax increases. But if government's too big, why would we ever be for a tax increase? If government's too big, we want government to be smaller. It used to always be the Republican mantra, and still is part of our platform, that if we have a problem with not enough funding, we cut spending, we don't raise taxes. And sometimes you don't even get an honest answer on that. I think some of your representatives will tell you that they play games with the budgetary numbers. They say, oh, we have a $456 million budget shortfall. But sometimes they're talking about a shortfall compared to a budget that they proposed that had increases. So even though we're in a severe recession in Kentucky, the budget's almost flat even with what it was last year. And they've been saying the governor's been playing this up for six months. There's a shortfall, a shortfall. We've got to raise taxes. Well, read between the lines. In the federal government, we went through the Bush administration, and this is how I'll differ from some Republicans. I don't, I don't need this office. I'm not going to go around and just say Republicans are always good. We had eight years of the Bush administration, and the deficit went from five trillion to ten trillion. We did a 
crummy job with the deficit. And it's also why we're shrinking as a party. When I went around the country for my dad, I went to 10 different states. Every primary I went to was a smaller Republican primary. And I used to say, it's not about who your nominee is, it's about your party shrinking. So we have to be able to grow our party. How do we grow it? I think there are two ways a Republican can win in Kentucky. You can run, when you win the Republican primary, you can become a Democrat, sort of by saying, I'll get you whatever you want. I can get more federal projects than the Democrat can get because I have more seniority. That's one way of doing it. I, to me, that's cool. I wouldn't drive all the way to Paducah if I wanted to just say we believe in more federal projects. That's a complete waste of time. That's not what Republicans are about. But there is another avenue. There is another avenue where I can bring independence in, and it's developing our believability again as a party. Obama understands this. When the Republicans voted almost to a person, they did vote to a person against the stimulus package. But he wags his finger at him and he says, who are you to criticize me? Y'all double the deficit on your watch. And then the media and everybody else are like, yeah. But there are also voters that say the same thing. I mean, independents and Democrats all the time who will vote for a Republican, and they don't have to be convinced that you're going to give them a handout or a special contract for them to get money from government. They want believability. They want lack of hypocrisy. They don't. They want a Republican who will stand up and say, by golly, that's a bipartisan problem, the deficit, and I will vote no against excessive wasteful spending. That's what they want. And I think you can win an election in Kentucky and in these border states that have sort of a 50-50 split. The election is very close every time. But it's not worth my while, your while, or anybody's while to go out and say, just run as a Democrat. Well, what a waste of time. We found out with Arlen Specter that to have a Democrat in your party who doesn't believe any of the Republican platform and never has, just to get his vote, I would never give money to a candidate like that. I won't be that kind of candidate, and I won't support a candidate like that. There's plenty of Republicans that are good that you can pick and choose who you want to support, and they're not all going to be to your liking, but you can, and you can find people. I used to tell people, this is, you know, and I used to kind of think this, I'm in my world, I'm doing fine, I've been for 15 years in Bowling Green, I don't need this office, and I say, well, it's just an academic question. The Great Depression, what caused the Great Depression, was it too much government or capitalism? It's an academic question. The people who won the battle wrote history textbooks, and they said it was capitalism, and I disagree with them. But we're having it again now, the panic of 2008. What caused the panic of 2008? Was it capitalism? Was it deregulation? Or was it perhaps the fact that the Federal Reserve reduced the interest rate to virtually zero and encouraged and fostered this housing boom? People say, oh no, it was just greedy mortgage brokers. Well, when did they become greedy? When did people become greedy that were never greedy before? Greed is, is profit. If, if I make it, I consider profit. You might not like me, you call it greed. Greed's just name calling. And is there some? Is there a vice called greed? Yes, but it's always been with us. Why did it all of a sudden collect in the mortgage industry? That, that, that makes no sense. Things collect because the mortgage industry was highly dependent on interest rates, and the government lowered the interest rates below what the market would do. I tell people, I like the analogy from medicine, that interest rates should be like insulin. When you eat your food, your insulin goes up, and it tamponades the effect and brings your blood sugar back down. As a marketplace gets overheated, as an economy grows into a bubble, the interest rates rise. So if the interest rates are zero, everybody borrows money and gets their project funded. If the interest rates are 10%, fewer people get their projects funded and only the best get it. Because if you're a mortgage broker and you're looking, you're looking at only the best of the best, and only the best of the best can afford 10% interest. So how did this bubble get going? What greed? Was it stupidity? Did the mortgage brokers say, were they just dumb? No, they made money for many years. From the Great Depression on, the price of homes went up like this. But then for the last five years, the price of homes went up exponentially. So you 